is going to make sure that that people enter it. So they go to submit a form, they're gonna get a little pop-up box that says, hey, you have to enter something here. We'll go ahead and see what that looks like in just a little bit, okay? Um, and then finally, a placeholder. A uh, placeholder is pretty cool because you can go ahead and insert, I, I guess what I call dummy text, um, so that users know what they should be entering and where they should be entering it. Um, I typically use a placeholder in combination with I'll actually go show you here with a label because if I if I don't um, I'm still just always concerned that that people aren't going to necessarily know what, where to go or whether something's going to to not render properly um, and so so it's better to be safe than sorry unless of course you're going for um, a very specific style on your web page all right let's take a look at this this web form demo here okay so um, note the use of placeholders, you're going to see those in action, and I'll sort of show you what we can do with autofocus as well. So um, let's go ahead and go over to WebMatrix. I'm going to pull up our forms demo, and let's go ahead and take a look at it in the browser first. So it's not very pretty. I'll apologize for that, but do notice here that we have our placeholder text. Here we have the placeholder text set as first name. Let's snap that real quickly here. And you can see that we have placeholder text that is last name, email address, and then also password. If I enter in a password here, like um, I love web matrix, um, notice that you weren't able to see me entering my password. I can go ahead and set it as visible. And of course, I spelled everything correctly, which is awesome. But uh, here we hide all the characters that are entered inside of a password field. All right. Let's take a look and see what happens if we add in the required field. I'm going to expand this real quickly here. What happens if, let's see, um, let's say that a first name is required. I'm going to go ahead and save the file, snap it back here real fast. Let's go ahead and refresh this page. So if I enter my last name, white, Col dot something at example.com and then I enter in a password. My password here is stuff. Not a good password, by the way. Um, and I go ahead and click submit. Oh, look at that. It says it's a required field and it is highlighted in red. Um, pretty nifty stuff, right? Pretty nifty stuff. Okay, so let's go ahead and head back to our presentation here. We saw everything in action. I want to double check and make sure we, we touch on everything. Oh, I want to show you autofocus too. I feel like a horrible human being if I didn't show you that. Not really, but I just feel like I should show you that. It's pretty important stuff. I'll bring that back up. Um, so let's say that we are filling out a form and we want, let's see here, we've got our, our first name field. We don't only want to make that required, but we want to go ahead and set this to autofocus. Okay, so we set it to autofocus. We'll set it equal to whoops. Set it to true. Sorry there. Um, another thing that's really important to keep in mind, guys and gals, is that um, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. I make tons and tons of mistakes, especially when you're starting out. Um, nobody's perfect, and so that's the first thing that I tell all my students. Like, if you make a mistake, it just means that you get to learn more, which is pretty cool. It's the best way to learn, in fact. Um, unless, of course, uh, you know, you break an arm or something like that. That'd be pretty bad. Let's go ahead and save this file. Make sure it's saved. Gonna go ahead and refresh, and now if I refresh the page, autofocus, it didn't give me that hue that I was talking about, and that might be different based on the browser that I'm using. But what it did do is when I land on the page, it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna place my cursor immediately inside of first name. And if you actually see there um, where I'm hovering over with the cursor, that's pretty cool. It said this is a required field, right? No asterisks, nothing like that, but, um, Definitely some cool stuff with HTML5 and, uh, and forms, okay? All right. 
Um, let's talk about form validation. You actually already have seen this in action. So validation is a process of, of verifying that information obtained from a form is in the appropriate format. Um, so sometimes we have issues like an empty field, right? I didn't enter my first name last time. Um, you might have an invalid date, an invalid email address. Maybe you're supposed to enter a telephone number. We've got to make sure that people are actually doing that when they enter their information on forms. Um, with HTML5, we can make this automatic, but in HTML4, it wasn't automatic, right? So here we can do something like this with HTML5 where we say, please provide a valid email address when somebody tries to click the submit button. Um, now, <clears throat> The type of validation that occurs with HTML5 is called client-side validation. So um, it happens inside the browser. So it's not gonna happen after information has been sent to a server somewhere in uh, California, maybe Redmond, Washington, um, wherever servers happen to be located. Um, if, if a user enters the wrong value into a form field, we also wanna make sure that the browser instructs them to, to correct the error. So, um, notice it's not just saying please provide a valid email address in the, the little pop-up on the right, uh, or not just provide an email address, but rather saying provide a valid email address. And so here we have Jane at live, and maybe that's supposed to be .com or .org, but we can set up a form so that people actually have to enter proper email addresses or telephone numbers. Uh, and you do this with the pattern attribute. And the pattern attribute can be pretty complex, but I strongly suggest you go ahead and take a look at, at Bing. Just do a quick search for HTML uh, forms pattern attribute. You can find a lot of really great information and some tutorials that are available um, to figure out how to utilize that um, in order to, to perform client-side validation. All right, so it's the end of our, our module three journey. Um, just as a quick recap, we discussed semantic HTML. Um, we reviewed tables and lists, how to create both. Um, we talked about how to create forms and how to handle different types of input. Um, super important, those types. And finally, we talked a little bit about form validation and what happens on the client side. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about how to perform validation, perform form validation with JavaScript, but that's a little bit later in, in module nine or something along those lines. I don't know, but uh, thanks again for joining me. Um, hope you had a good time. We'll see you next in module four. Bye. Welcome back to HTML5 Application Development Fundamentals. I'm Cullen, and we're about to head into Module 4 and start our wonderful voyage into cascading style sheets. Um, right now, we're going to go ahead and focus on some basics of content flow, positioning, and styling. And uh, let's take a look at the agenda, actually. Um, talk a little bit about what cascading style sheets are. Um, talk about their selectors and declarations. Talk a little bit about fonts and font families, then content flow, positioning, and then content overflow, um, which is very different from content flow, okay? So keep that in mind, all right? Um, without further ado, cascading style sheets. Uh, CSS, or cascading style sheets, is a language that's separate from HTML, and it defines how elements are styled. So in other words, HTML structures a document, CSS formats it. Um, I think of these things as layers. So if uh, maybe if you're building a building, right, HTML would be the foundation, right? So it sits on the bottom. And then you add CSS on top and to the exterior because it styles it. Um, later, we're going to add functionality with another layer called JavaScript, right? And so you can't have one without the other. So you need HTML um, before you can really apply CSS and then JavaScript um, is going to make things move to um, typically you're going to apply that after CSS as well, but uh, teach their own on that one. Um, CSS can be applied to single HTML elements or it can be applied to groups. Um, CSS files are stored as style sheets and they have they feature the the CSS extension here. So you can see up on on the screen in this example, whoops. Um, 
right here, this one is titled example.css, right? Um, unlike HTML, CSS uses rules instead of tags. So this whole thing right here is a rule, right? That's going to define the style. Um, CSS3 is the version of CSS that was, was released in conjunction with HTML5, so they're partners in crime. Um, CSS3 is backwards compatible, which means that it can easily be used with, with older versions of HTML and CSS. Um, there, is, there are a couple of exceptions, though. Um, some, some older browsers won't properly render um, HTML that's been, been styled with CSS3. Um, so do keep that in mind. We'll touch on that throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, there are a number of, of new effects in CSS3 as well, including 2D and 3D transformations, and, and then also animations too. Um, we'll detail all of these wonderful things about the third version of Cascading Style Sheets. Um, first, let's go ahead and talk about how we can link a CSS file with HTML, or how we can just link CSS with HTML, period, right? There are three different ways to do it. So one, we have inline styling, okay? So we have our HTML element, P, and we have the style attribute, and all we're gonna do is we're gonna add something simple like color red, right? That's a, a declaration. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that here um, in terms of the structure of CSS. Um, you're also gonna see me throughout this presentation and others um, using the style element which is going to be nested inside of, of the head tags at the top of an HTML document, right? So um, we can do it inline with each element. We could add it in um, as a style element inside of the head tags. And then third, we can link a separate CSS file. Um, this is great if you have large amounts of CSS, and it really is, is how you should be doing things when you're designing a, a fully functional website. For, for our tiny little... Um, little uh, simple websites, we're, we're probably gonna do a lot of, of number one and number two, but if you create more robust websites, you definitely, definitely, definitely wanna focus on the third way of linking um, CSS to HTML, okay? Um, <clears throat> just to, to highlight a couple of advantages of placing CSS in a separate file, um, you can apply a style change to an entire document um, or you can, can work with the team across different web projects and you can maintain the same style. So I can go ahead and I can share everything that I'm doing in my CSS file with all of my friends who are also building web pages and then they all use the same style. And that is a really, really cool thing. And it definitely makes your job a lot easier if you're developing um, web pages or web applications, okay? All right, let's keep on rolling. Um, so let's, let's talk about that, that link tag a little bit, okay? Um, CSS files are linked to HTML files using the link element. Um, the link element has an href attribute, which is going to point to the, the file source for the style sheet. It's, it's really, really important that we make sure that our file name and the location are correct, or else none of our style will be applied. Um, we'll keep getting all those simple little HTML pages that, that we had that, that just look real ugly and plain, okay? Um, we're going to use the rel attribute, set that as style sheet, and then we use the type attribute, we set that as text forward slash CSS. This is the way it's done every single time. The only thing that really should change when you're linking a CSS file is, is maybe the name of the file itself and its, its location. All right, so let's go ahead and get started and dive a little bit deeper in, into selectors and declarations. So there, there are two different parts of a CSS rule. You have a selector, which could be like H1, it could be P, it could be any element that you want styled on a page, or you could use IDs or classes. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but uh, a selector, right, is 